In early spring, the swallow-tailed kite appears over the Gulf Coast. It is a herald of a great wave of life that will soon pass over these shores. A billion tropical birds coming to breed in the North American summer. By April, they are already breeding in the Florida Panhandle. But the greatest part of migration is still to come. Every day for nearly a month, tens of millions of small and colorful songbirds arrive in America. For a brief time, these coastal woodlands are overrun as hundreds of species of every shape and color pour into America. Hi, I'm Jim Stevenson and I'm an ornithologist on Galveston Island, Texas. I'm in my yard, which is a wonderful place for bird migration. In spring and fall, we get loads of all kinds of birds coming through. And today we're going to talk a little bit about bird migration. As the sun appears to rise in the spring in the northern hemisphere, it creates a larger food chain. There's more light for photosynthesis. And that photosynthesis is, of course, the bottom of our food chain. And that's when the birds arrive and they begin arriving and breeding at southern latitudes first, like say Florida or Texas, and then gradually further north until finally by June, birds even in Alaska are carrying on their reproductive activities. It's all dependent on the light. Birds need a way of synchronizing migration with seasonal change. The key is a network of photoreceptors inside their endocrine glands. Light is scattered through muscle and bone and reaches the pituitary, where it stimulates the release of hormones that govern migratory and breeding behavior. It's what we call the photoperiod. It's the length of light in the day. It does several things biochemically. Uh, it begins to enlarge their gonads. There is plumage change that often takes place with birds. And of course, uh, something many people are aware of is the male birds begin to sing. Migratory birds increase the time spent foraging for food. This is called hyperphagia, greatly increased feeding behavior. They have to eat food which allows them to store up white fat. This is from eating foods that are rich in carbohydrates. These carbs allow the somewhat slower burning of sugar so that they can make long flights and um, won't run out of energy in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Physical activity is also increased in pure restlessness. As each day grows longer, birds become more and more active at twilight. After a few weeks, this migratory restlessness culminates in long flights. But a formidable obstacle stands in the way of birds between them and North America is the Gulf of Mexico, the largest gulf in the world. They face a choice. Make a non-stop flight of 600 miles or more over the gulf, or detour around it and nearly double the length of their journey. The remarkable fact of bird life in America is that the majority of all birds flying into the continent cross the gulf in a single flight. The use of weather radar allowed scientists to first document the magnitude of the flight. Each April and May, a billion or more tropical birds, most weighing less than a couple of quarters, make a nonstop flight of 20 to 30 hours over the Gulf. It is the largest open water migration of land birds on the planet. More than 200 species from dozens of families make the crossing following the shoreline, their migration winds up being shaped like a bow rather than the string of the bow. So if you add 60% to their flight, then there's a lot more energy expended, but also they are susceptible to predators. When out in the Gulf of Mexico, there are no predators. This time of year, in April, birds are leaving the tropics at dusk and they fly all night and will arrive here late morning or early afternoon, and, and that's six to 900 miles of flight. The fact is that most bird families are so well adapted to long distance flight that crossing the Gulf is relatively easy. Their engine is a highly efficient respiratory system. A complex arrangement of expandable air sacs fills the bird's body and even its bones. Air passes through the lungs in a single direction, 
meaning that incoming and outgoing air don't mix. And compared to mammals, the rigid lungs of birds are more densely packed with capillaries. Birds thus consume more oxygen throughout each breath, allowing them to maintain more vigorous activity. The main limiting factor to nonstop flights is the amount of fat that birds can store. And because of their seasonal hyperphagia, they can store a very large amount of fat. Birds depart from three primary areas. Here, they are greatly aided by seasonal winds blowing to the northwest out of the Caribbean and over the Yucatan. Species wintering in the West Indies fly directly over the water to the Florida coast. Some birds even make a thousand mile flight from northern South America. But the primary staging area is the Yucatan Peninsula. Jutting out 200 miles to the north, this limestone platform is the perfect launching pad for trans-gulf flights. The daily movement reaches its peak in late April. At dusk, migrants in the tropics move to the treetops and wait. Just when the stars appear, they take flight and rise over the gulf. Flying around 30 miles per hour in the cool darkness, they will make the crossing in 16 to 20 hours, arriving at the northern Gulf Coast in late morning or early afternoon. Pushed to the west by seasonal winds over the Gulf, the greatest density of migrants reaches land along the upper Texas coast and southwestern Louisiana. The land here is naturally flat and open, a complex of barrier islands, marshes, and grassland. It's poor habitat for woodland birds. But the 600-mile crossing is so easy for most of them that they will fly for another hour or more, dispersing only when they cross the southern border of the deciduous forest. the wind is blowing hard out of the south, uh, they may take advantage of that and fly inland 30 or 40 miles, but oftentimes they can only make it to the shore. They must rely on widely scattered and fragmented coastal woodlands. All of the barrier islands are certainly important because when birds are migrating, they have to have food and water and shelter. In fall, this is their last stop before they cross the gulf. And in spring, it's the first landfall as they come back from 600 miles from Yucatan or 900 miles from Venezuela or diagonally across the Gulf from the West Indies. One of the largest in the chain is Galveston, stretching 27 miles across the upper Texas coast. This barrier island is at the epicenter of trans-Gulf migration. Amid the cattle pastures and beach houses of the island's west end, there are few resting places for transient birds. But there's a surprise in the flat landscape, a thick knob of trees. It's an old hurricane shelter raised 14 feet above the island. Ranchers used to herd cattle on top to escape the storm surge. Now it's an overgrown hammock. It's in small woodlands like this that one can experience the wonder of the Gulf crossing. For a few days each spring, these trees come alive, filled for a moment with the colorful horde of passing birds. This early in the morning, the hammock is quiet. Most migrants are still over the Gulf, far from sight of land. Some twittering high in the air announces the arrival of the very fastest birds. Chimney swifts slice through the air like guided missiles. Spending their life on the wing, they cross the gulf with ease. Hummingbirds are close behind. Because of their fast metabolism, they readily stop and feed here. 
This gateway to the north, at the edge of the eastern forests and central plains, is a crossroads of bird life. Sandpipers are champions of long-distance migration. Each year, they make prodigious flights across the hemisphere, often traveling thousands of miles nonstop. The white-rumped sandpiper has come more than 7,000 miles from the coast of southern Argentina, a crucial wintering ground for sandpipers. It may have made this trip in only two long flights, crossing South America and then the Caribbean and Gulf. It still has to cross the Central Plains and Boreal Forest to reach the Arctic. When they reach the north, these birds will feast on the mass of invertebrate life that round-the-clock sunlight brings to the wet tundra. Plovers are another large group. They search for food not by touch, but by sight finding prey with their big eyes. Several reddish egrets can almost always be found at the western tip of the island. The scissor-tailed flycatcher is a specialty of the southern plains. It is more commonly found in fields and grasslands with its close relative, the eastern kingbird. Finally, around noon, the waves of transgulf migrants begin to appear. Songbirds flying thousands of feet up are practically invisible. It is only when they descend to Earth that we can see migration is happening. They land by diving out of the sky, falling directly to Earth. Suddenly, birds appear sitting quietly in the treetops. First are the stronger flyers, like grosbeaks and thrushes. Soon, the daily arrival of birds reaches its peak. We have many, many transgulf migrants. Many of our warblers, uh, some flycatchers, thrushes, tanagers, orioles, uh, grosbeaks and buntings. Of all the neotropical migrants, the most diverse, colorful, and numerous are the wood warblers. More than 30 species cross the gulf each year. 
His family is so successful that they nest from the mangrove swamps of southern Florida to the tree line in northern Alaska and in nearly every wooded habitat in between. Warblers are perfectly adapted to exploit the burst of insect life in seasonal forests, some pacing the ground or scouring the bark or flitting over the canopy. Because most insect life disappears in the fall, the tremendous success of these tiny birds depends on their ability to migrate long distances. The largest of a handful of wooded areas on the island, this hundred-year-old grove of live oaks provides important habitat for many migrants, especially those that prefer the undergrowth. As the day ends, the woods are still, but the procession of birds continues. They will not rest with the coming of darkness. Driven by the incessant need to fly north, all but the most fatigued birds will leave the coast in the waning twilight. In many cases, departing only a few hours after they made landfall. Birds have a system of sensory adaptations that allow them to orient using natural phenomena. Just before they depart at dusk, they can sense the direction of polarized light from the setting sun. They can also orient to the stars of the night sky. And like many other kinds of animals, they can detect the shape of the Earth's magnetic field. About a half hour after sunset, birds take flight draining out of the coastal woodlands in less than an hour. Overland flights by migrants are generally shorter than the Gulf crossing, between 100 and 200 miles. Tonight, however, the south winds are favorable and birds may fly till dawn. An atmospheric trough is moving east, sucking up air from the south. A cold front is coming. 25 miles up the coast from Galveston lies the most famous migration hotspot on the upper Texas coast, High Island. Its famed groves of live oaks can host huge numbers of grounded neotropicals. But today, is not one of those days. With strong winds off the Gulf, a heavy flow of migrants is pushing far inland. This creates a coastal hiatus, a gap along the coastline where few migrants can be found. When the cold front finally reaches the Gulf, the wind and rain at the frontal boundary create a unique phenomenon. Every bird that reaches land will immediately seek shelter in whatever habitat it can find. The interesting thing that happens, which is probably good for birders, but not so good for birds, is when birds migrating north experience inclement weather. And this causes uh, what we call groundings or fallouts where thousands of birds will come out of the air, often along the coast, and will create quite a smorgasbord for birders. On days with north winds, when a cold front surprises them, they may not arrive until after dark, which means the flight could be more than 24 hours. At dawn, after a night of stiff north winds, the hammock is simply covered in grounded birds. 
fallouts can bring together the majority of the neotropical species that cross the Gulf. Hundreds of birds may be crowded into tiny patches of woodland. These events provide a fleeting cross-section of the mighty river of birds passing high over the coast each day in spring. After the front passes, the high pressure behind it moves over the Gulf. The next day, the south wind rises and intensifies, becoming nearly a gale off the water. In late April, these atmospheric highs begin to stabilize over the western Atlantic. Because air circulates clockwise in high pressure systems, the wind is from the north off of Florida, but from the south here in the western Gulf. This weather pattern, known as a Bermuda High, is characteristic of the change from winter to summer. The warm air of the tropics is expanding over America. The strengthening high over the southeast weakens the track of polar fronts, pushing them northward. Trans-Gulf migrants take advantage of this shift, mostly crossing after mid-April, precisely when cold fronts decline and south winds strengthen. After a day of south winds, the hammock is deserted. Only this bay-breasted warbler has stayed. It was greatly stressed by the cold front. When a bird's fat reserves are used up in flight, its metabolism will seek a fuel of last resource. It will consume its own muscles. This may give the bird just enough energy to reach shelter. This individual will have to recover some fat before moving north. As the south winds blow for hundreds of miles day after day, they push the water north as well, depositing mats of seaweed and other floating debris on Gulf beaches. Undoubtedly, even with south winds, a few birds drop, but with cold fronts, particularly accompanied by rain or strong north winds, they become quite an agent of natural selection and the weaker birds may die out in almost inestimable numbers. There have certainly been cold fronts where a few days later we began finding the beaches littered with birds that had died and washed in. And that may well not be the majority of the birds that actually died. It really points out, number one, the value of bird migration to a species, and number two, the advantage of being a trans-gulf migrant over a circumgulf migrant because otherwise 
why would they have evolved to risk such a thing? If this warm air prevails over eastern America and hastens the arrival of spring, it will at the same time push migrating birds. Already, masses of birds are far inland, well on their way to the great northern forest. Just across the Charles River from Boston is another famous place for neotropicals. This patch of green in a large urban area can attract many spring migrants. The migration begins by mid-April with the arrival of three species of warbler. The pine warbler, befitting its name, is almost always found near pine trees. The palm warbler is usually found on the ground, bobbing its tail. The yellow rumped warbler is the most common warbler of all, nesting by the millions across the coniferous forests of Canada. By the second week of May, the main body of neotropical migrants arrives feasting on the new insect life in the budding oaks. Most are now singing regularly, a sure sign that they're not far from their summer homes. Neotropical birds can be divided into two overlapping groups, birds of deciduous forest and birds of mixed or evergreen forest. By early May, spring growth is peaking in deciduous woodlands and right on cue, the local breeders appear. How exactly birds return to the same breeding location each year, having traveled thousands of miles away and back again, is still a mystery. One extraordinary theory is that birds are able to locate a specific home range by its smell, like salmon finding their ancestral watershed. Their behavior now changes dramatically. They're no longer heedless transients feeding wherever they can. Each species breeds in a specific habitat and they can't be found anywhere else. 
The power line clearings of Sterling Forest attract a diverse group of neotropicals that prefer the edges of deciduous woodlands. Male birds spend much of their time high in trees. The singing advertises their presence to arriving females and establishes a territory from which they will chase off any other males. The males arrive first and they begin singing and they'll set up a territory so that when the females arrive, the female can pick the particular male that she's most impressed with and they will mate and uh, begin nest building and within a few weeks uh, she'll lay eggs. By the time the chicks are hatched, the pair is very busy. What you have to bear in mind is that in the spring and summer on their breeding grounds, they have to be able to gather enough food, not only for themselves, but for their family. And that's helped by the fact that they have many more hours in a day. Although birds have been breeding for months, migration continues till the end of May. Now birds of the evergreen forest dominate. By Memorial Day, the most common species is the black pole warbler, one of the northernmost breeders. Farther north and at higher elevations, the transition forest begins. This is the vast region where deciduous woodlands give way to coniferous trees. Above 40 degrees latitude, daylight fluctuates from less than 8 to more than 16 hours. For a few months, biomass increases faster here than anywhere else on Earth. It is here that neotropical migrants reach their greatest concentration. And it is here that one particular genus of warblers, Cetophasia, is dominant. The black-throated blue warbler is typical. Higher in the trees, you find the black-throated green warbler. In denser growth, the magnolia warbler appears. The yellow rumped warbler is common all across the more carnivorous growth. And at the very tops of the spruces and firs, you find the Blackburnian warbler. Above 3,000 feet in the mountains of the northeast, where spruce and fir dominate, the black pole warbler nests. This is the boreal zone. To find the last of the cetophagia warblers, you have to go even deeper into the boreal forest. There, you can find the palm and the bay-breasted, and even the rare Cape May. For the last million years, the transition and boreal forest have repeatedly been driven out of the north by miles-thick sheets of ice. At the height of the last ice age, boreal forest types could be found in Alabama and Georgia. It was the melting of the ice sheets that created migration in its current form. With the warming of the earth, which began about 18,000 years ago, birds naturally began to spread out in spring they would fly north a little bit, but then in fall, of course, they had to go back to the equator because it was just too cold for them. This adaptability allowed them to expand and contract their range across the tens of thousands of generations that take up each glacial cycle. It was also this adaptability that allowed warblers to rapidly diversify across the ice ages, a time when other species were being exterminated.
A mere six weeks after mating and nesting, most juvenile birds have left the nest. The breeding pair divides the brood and moves freely in search of prey, followed by the juvenile young. Young birds have roughly a month in which to learn to fend for themselves and grow out their immature plumage. A few weeks out of the nest and the parents withdraw to molt and then migrate south. The juveniles face the journey to the tropics all on their own. Amazingly, the adults will leave and migrate south and the young are left to migrate and fend for themselves. And I think one of the real miracles in all of biology is how a young bird, only maybe two months old, can make that flight to Central or South America without their parents. Their instincts will drive them in a precise pattern for thousands of miles over the earth. If they miss their way or fail to find adequate habitat, they will perish. Out of the slow days of late summer, the southward migration begins almost imperceptibly. By late July, shorebirds are already conspicuous migrants. Fall's southward movement is generated by the same hormonal process of the spring. The declining sun of late summer triggers the molting, fat accumulation, and restlessness that leads to migration. Occupying 40 miles of the Gulf Shore in North Florida, St. Mark's is formed by the merging of pine oak flatwoods with salt marshes and tidal pools. Its diverse geography attracts a wide variety of migratory birds. Without the pressure to breed, the southward movement is much more leisurely. Many are still reaching the Gulf Coast in October. The yellow-throated warbler is a striking resident of southern pine and oak forests. It particularly favors trees with Spanish moss. Somehow, birds recognize they are at the edge of the gulf. If they are in poor condition, they are more likely to fly around the gulf than over it. Some, like this prairie warbler, may linger on the coast for a week or more. The blue-winged teal is another early migrant. It arrives here months before most other ducks. Prevailing winds concentrate the fall migration in the east. Because birds normally avoid flying over the Atlantic, they pile up along the eastern seaboard, forming what is known as the Atlantic Flyway. Locations on the Atlantic coast of Florida can host prodigious numbers of fall migrants. On this day, subsequent to the passing of a cold front, these thick palm oak hammocks are filled with hundreds of birds. Many neotropicals lose their color in the late summer molt, making them harder to identify. This bay-breasted warbler hardly resembles the spring version. Since they have time to take a longer route, much of the fall migration passes over the Florida Peninsula. By circumnavigating the water, they also avoid the danger of late summer hurricanes over warm Gulf waters. The birds that do cross the Gulf in the fall wait for favorable conditions. These conditions are the very thing that is so dangerous to them in the spring, a cold front pushing south over the water. The interesting thing is, cold fronts also produce a lot of birds in the fall, but for exactly the opposite reason. In spring, these cold fronts with their wind and rain stop the birds, but in fall, they bring the birds. The photo period will get them flighty, but it is actually the cold front that often gets them going. As the cold front is passing, they'll wait and wait, and as soon as the dew point drops, that's when they take off. And actually, the dew point really signals the fact that the cold front has passed, 
high pressure cell is moving in, moisture is dropping, and that would be the most advantageous time to leave. As the front moves south, birds all across the east take flight behind it. When the cold air mass reaches the southern edge of the continent and spills out over the water, trans-gulf flight begins in earnest. Birds close to the shore will launch in a wave. The favorable winds make the crossing much safer as they can rise to five or even 10,000 feet and be pushed southward at high speed. Many birds starting from farther north will pile up at the coast their last chance to stop before open water. After a front passes, migrant traps along the Gulf shore can be packed with birds. St. George Island, like Galveston Island to the west, is a way station of the Gulf Passage. Behind the dunes is a small forest of pine oak scrub. It is here that on certain special days, one can see the wave of migrants brought to the coast by fall cold fronts. Neotropicals retreat from Canada and Northern America while it is still green. These insectivorous birds cannot survive the loss of deciduous foliage. By the time the leaves begin to fall in October, nearly all are far to the south. But there are a few exceptions. Black pole warblers gather in the northeast in the fall. A few proceed down the eastern seaboard with other neotropicals. Most remain waiting. It is here that fall cold fronts produce an almost unthinkable phenomenon. Spurred by powerful north winds behind the front, black poles fly directly over the Atlantic, 2,000 miles in one flight to the Amazon rainforest. The direct flight cuts 1,000 miles from their journey. This astonishing nonstop flight over the Atlantic Ocean may last three or four days. Late in October, the last neotropical migrants reach the Gulf Coast. St. George Island is overrun with yellow rumped and palm warblers. Their appearance signals the end of trans-Gulf migration. Ducks, sparrows, hawks, and others will continue to reach the coast, but they will remain in the south. For six months of every year, the neotropical species live beyond the Gulf in the forests of Latin America. There, they will await the return of the sun and the renewal of an ancient cycle that spans the hemisphere.
with many species, their populations are about 40% less than they were even 25 or 30 years ago, which is a tremendous decline in a relatively short period of time. When we continually cut down forests along the coast to build condominiums or whatever, then we are taking away habitat for these birds. And if too many birds crowd into a habitat, there are not the resources. And so with deforestation of the tropics, as well as degradation of coastal habitats, and all the forest fragmentation which has taken place on their breeding grounds, birds are really being decimated in all parts of their lives. And that's why we've lost probably 40% of our songbirds. Still, these creatures of the sun return each spring, as they have since long before men appeared here, irresistibly driven to follow life where it leads them. They fly into a dark future, but for now, on a special day in late April, one can still experience the miracle of a spring fallout. The river of birds aloft is forced into a little patch of woods on the coast, and nature bursts forth with dizzying vitality.
flying over the scattered landscape of the Americas. They are not creatures of this or that place, but the Earth itself. 